Hey everyone, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. Okay, I am here with my wrap-up for the Cult of Barnacle Bay. Wander, the Cult of Barnacle Bay. Um, so everyone who watched my uh, Let's Play and Slash Review, thank you, I appreciate it. Sorry we had to uh, truncate the full thing a little bit, but I will most likely be back to this game on my channel because I I love this game. I think this game is fantastic. Um, I do have some issues with it and I mentioned some of those issues throughout my playthrough slash review and I'll kind of revisit some of those today and between um, the th few things I got right, the things I got wrong and Tristan's wonderful rules corrections, you should have a pretty good idea of how this game plays. But once again, my videos are never supposed to be uh, used for reference for reference on how to play a game um, strictly by the by the in, in regards to the rules. Um, I am, like I've said many times before, far more concerned about theme and art and just the the joy that these kinds of games bring me so there are a lot of things that i greatly enjoy about the cult of barnacle bay um, i did mention this in my unboxing take a look at the video earlier this year that i used to be super into these kind of um, anthropomorphic animal uh, things like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and that kind of stuff and I still have a great fondness for the beast epic in terms of literature things you know like Watership Down and Book of the Dumb Cow and that kind of thing and the Redwall books I I think they are just really captivating there's something about there is something about putting animals in human situations and depicting them viewing human struggles through the eyes of small animals. Now, I know that's not exactly what's going on here. There are different sub-genres of the beast epic, you know, whether or not the beasts were once human that were turned into um, critters, kind of like mice and mystics, whether or not we're dealing with things like Watership Down, where they're not really anthropomorphized. Uh, <laughs> I can never say that word right, sorry. Whether or not they're, they're, the animals are depicted as humans, whether they can use tools, or if they're just um, depicted more as the animals with um, sentient thoughts and, and language, or the cult of Barnacle Bay, which is kind of like just um, the animals are the human sentient like beings who live in this world they 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 have always been like this nothing changed them into the animal form some of the um creatures have been mutated from the forces of evil within the world but they've always been the you know the the, the dominant creatures in this in this world but so that Already the, the, the theme is enticing to me. And then we get to the art, which is really gorgeous. All of the color on the tiles. Um, I, I do want to show off some of the tiles. I, I, I think they're, even, even the, the small tiles. I mentioned before how, during the playthrough, how I think the tiles really do a great job of of creating a, a real sense of, of, of space. And I really feel like when I'm playing, when I'm moving throughout the tiles, I really feel like I am moving um, through an actual created land. I mean, this is, this, this is a wonderful tile here. You've got the docks here with some uh, tentacles coming up and it, it looks like it smells briny and that it's kind of gunky and you can like scrape off dirt and stuff. But at the same time, it's not overly grotesque. It's bright, it's colorful. I mean, look at that. That is some amazing art. The art direction on this game 
is really is top notch. I can't fault anything with the art. And then that leads me right into like the characters. Okay, all of the characters that you get in uh, the base game and of course the, the Kickstarter version, which I, I'm not even sure how widely available this game was at retail. I think the base game is still available. And I do see some of the non-Kickstarter exclusive character packs on eBay for not too much money. The one thing that you really can't get much anymore is the High Tide expansion with the enemies, which is a real shame. Uh, that I really think that is needed to, to really round out the experience. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a real shame that that's not available. Hopefully they can get it back into print at some time, but the, uh, all of the characters are just really well drawn and depicted with interesting abilities that I think add a whole bunch to the game. Um, you know, they, the, the, I've probably played only about six or so of the characters during my uh, time with the game, and each one really does feel different. Some of them are more different than others. For instance, we were playing with Tank and Ross, and Tank and Ross are both kind of tanky characters because Ross's abilities also add to the defensive capabilities of the characters and so um they were i was probably playing with two characters that were more similar than i could have been but for me i thought that worked out because playing with only two you kind of want to have a tanky party um another thing i like that i've mentioned many times before is this event deck now we didn't get to see a lot of these on camera uh, but you know this this girl here uh, Trixie, you know, she Totally saved our asses on that playthrough. I got some really good items from her So always nice to nice to see Trixie show up But you just get all kinds of things like we found that creature in the well, which is really cool You can find one use items such as these spells uh, Sometimes you can get I mean this guy here is a something awful um, some dark corners are best left alone. Spawn one mega brute at the closest spawn portal. So this card here, I mean, you could find like almost a, a mini boss while you were playing a regular game. That would have been like just absolutely catastrophic if that thing would have shown up. But there's so many things, that, and I think the balance of all of these does shift more towards benefiting the party than it does hurting them, and that that's cool because. You never want, I don't think you ever want to, um, unless you're trying to go for something like uh, like Dungeon Quest or um, Warhammer Quest or something really deadly, right? Or Dark Light. You want to entice the players to explore. So having some good things for them to find is very beneficial and it makes finding them really fun. And then when something bad happens, you know, every once in a while, you're just like, oh man, we have to deal with this now. But it's not an overwhelming abundance of, um, of bad things that can happen. Or like uh, Kingdom Death Monster, you know. Kingdom Death Monster, every time you explore something, you're like, Ugh, I don't know if I want to do this, but I kind of want to see what happens. And it's almost always bad. But, and then let's see, what else do I really like? I love the items. There are a ton of them. And they keep getting better too. The level three items, which we never really saw, some of them are just amazing. Uh, the BFGB, this is a weapon, a two-handed range weapon, six. You roll six dice and you get a plus two re-roll. If you do not roll any hits, take an arrow to the knee and suffer one wound. All right, so you've got some little, some internet humor going on there, but it's not in the abundance, it's not like obnoxious. Uh, the saw sword, you get uh, six dice for attacking with melee. Uh, the art is nice. The cards are well written. The rules on the on most of the item cards are um, concise. So I do like that. The other thing that I like a lot, but it does add a little, it does add some complexity to the game. And I'm sure you guys saw quite a few times during my playthrough where I I missed or misappropriated, misattributed 
one of the initiative bonuses to for the heroes or for the enemies but this advanced in, um, initiative track that has the bonuses listed adds a interesting strategic depth to the game and the fact that you can manipulate it in little ways adds a lot I would like to see more dungeon crawls use an initiative track like this I think that's great a really good addition uh, let's see I do also like this is a weird thing to like but it's something I appreciate this is all of the tokens in the game they all fit in one little tray and there aren't hundreds of them one thing that turns me off of a game is when they advertise like 500 plus tokens I'm like holy crap that means I'm gonna have to organize those I'm gonna have to get trays I'm gonna have to get little little tubs I'm gonna have to uh, punch them all out I like games that have a few tokens but utilize what they have strategically and intuitively and one of the best companies for that I think is Plaid Hat Games a lot of the Jerry Hawthorne games they don't come with a ton of tokens but the tokens that they come with are important to the theme and to the uh, the mechanisms of the game and I feel the same exact way about um, Cult of Barnacle Bay it is I guess you could just say it's the perfect amount of tokens. That's what we, I know that's a weird thing, but it is something that I pay attention to. Another game that does it well, even though there are more, is Folklore of the Affliction. And the reason that does it well is because on the backs of the tokens, it actually tells you what the token does, what the bonus, what the hindrance is. So the boon, the bane, the good, the bad. That is awesome. I wish more games did that with the tokens. Told you what they do. Uh, Madara. Madara is a huge, like, massive game, but it too only has two trays of tokens, and every token almost lists what the effect is on the token, so you don't have to go rummaging through the rule book. Excellent job there. This game does not list what is on the token, so it could have elevated itself a little bit in that regard, but um, there aren't a ton of them, so you're not constantly having to look things up. Uh, let's see what else well you know I like these exploration cards how these can change up the map and make things um, a little more interesting on the tiles you can add walls to the tiles I like the spawning system the items the uh, the way the experience points work I kind of like so that is so even though I did get some rules wrong I don't think that any of my criticism of the game I don't think any of my criticisms are based upon a mishandling of the rules or a misunderstanding of the game. And so that's where I think it's okay for like, you know, for people to make mistakes while you're playing and then to, you don't, you don't have to play a game perfectly in order to criticize it. It helps. And when you're critical about a game based on a misunderstanding of the rules, that can be a problem. But I think my criticisms, the few I have of the game, are based upon a sound understanding. One of my criticisms of the game is how the second part of every scenario does seem to slow down as you start gaining experience because you have to defeat the enemies on almost every scenario. I haven't played every scenario, but I'm going to say that from what I've read, most of the scenarios have an objective that all the enemies have to be killed. So every time you kill an enemy, you're going to gain a certain number of experience points. And every time you gain a certain number of experience points, you're going to spawn more enemies, which means you have to kill more enemies and gain more experience and spawn more enemies. So there is this, um, it's a kind of this snowballing effect. And I understand why they did that. They wanted to ramp up the tension, but rather than ramping up the tension, I think what it actually does is it actually bogs down the game. It would have been nice if you could, you know, if you only had to kill a certain number of enemies and then those that were spawned because of XP spawning, you could have avoided and still completed your other objectives. During the boss fights, however, 
I think the XP system works wonderfully. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. As you're wailing on the boss, you know, shooting him and casting spells, you're gaining XP for every wound that you do to a boss. And then as you go up in, in, in tears, that boss, he gets fired up, right? He, uh, he gets pissed off at you. And as you get more powerful, he also gets more powerful and he gets to take extra actions. That is a wonderful way of handling that growing escalation. I really like that. I like how like, you know, if you're going from level one to level two, where you immediately get that level, that extra action, but then the first time that happens in the game, the boss interrupts your turn and he takes an extra um, attack. So very, very well done in that regard. The, the boss battles are a highlight and that's because of these AI cards more dungeon crawls, more fantasy adventure games really need to start incorporating this kind of AI system in with their bosses and mini bosses because it makes those encounters feel special and it makes them feel intense because you just you never know what is going to happen. Uh, I'm sure as you start to play the boss over and over again, like in something like K, uh, KDM or Hellboy, you're going to get familiar with these because you do use all of them every time. The decks are never changed, but still, they're not just simply like they're not simply uh, moving and attacking. Things change up, and it makes the players have to kind of think on their feet about what's going to happen. Um, the rules they are fiddly. I, I, I can't get over that. I made a lot of mistakes, I know that. Um, the few mistakes I made, I, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that the mistakes I made in favor of the heroes and in favor of the enemies, I think they balanced out. I might have been making maybe a few more mistakes in favor of the heroes, which means that I made the game a little easier for myself. That is a possibility. But I don't think it was so bad that it would have changed the outcome of the game. I missed—I know I missed a bunch of rerolls, especially on my last boss battle. When I rewatched it, I noticed that I did miss some rerolls I could have done with the um, with my defense rerolls, which could have actually gave Tank a few more crits to do wounds. But I also did a few things wrong with the boss, so I'm pretty sure it balanced out. Um, but one of the so like the rules are kind of i think they're mostly there some things are a little unclear and so we do have uh tristan's faq that he made but like just for for an example um let's go back so if you go to the rule page on page 34 where it tells what to hap what happens when a hero gets what gets down gets knocked out and ways that um to rally so Next, the moral token moves one space down. The down hero may not perform any actions besides trying to rally. A hero successfully rallies when rolling a crit symbol. Once the hero rallies, stand the hero model back up and freely move them two spaces without incurring a dodge roll. When a hero rallies, they heal for half of their max XP. You know, the, the healing half, it, it gets really fiddly. Um, alternatively, another hero with a health potion may spend the health potion to rally. And I just, it seems a little, it seems like it could have been a little more clear in the rules. But it could just be me because I am having to keep so many rules to so many games in my mind when I'm playing uh, one game or another or learning a game or playing a game with one group and another group that. It could just be a, it very much could be just a symptom of the kind of thing I do with playing a lot of games and just reading a lot of rule books all the time that I, I do have some issues when things aren't spelled out as clearly as possible. For people who are more adept at understanding rules than I am, the kind of ambiguities may not, um, may not hinder them. But Overall, in terms of Kickstarter rules, this is in the top 90%, 90 percentile, easily. And finally, finally, the thing I really like is the, uh, is the, 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 the campaign. So the, um, 
the campaign, the branching narratives, the branching scenarios, the way that uh, you have to move around the city and under the city and to different things. I, I love it. It is so cool. It adds so much to the game. Um, I wish more games had this kind of branching scenario. It, it does it in an easy way. It's simple, but it really makes a huge difference. So yeah, that's it. That is uh, basically my playthrough and review for Wander the Cult of Barnacle Bay. Great game. Highly recommended if you can find everything. Um, I really do hope that... Oh, I f the dice system. How can I forget that? The exploding dice is always, always fun. Um, just like, like, you, I, like you guys saw in my boss video when I was hitting those crits, just like, oh man, it just, it just makes you feel so good. But then in that video before, when I was like not hitting any of the hits, it could be really defeating. So like always, dice, these little cubes of divination, high highs and low lows and not a lot in between. You're never just kind of like, mm, all right. But you're always just kind of like, oh, or yeah, but that's the nature of these games and if you like that great if you don't like that you're playing different games but yeah so I really hope that they can get this game um, back into retail with all the with the expansion that set the retail set and the couple extra retail heroes and the high tide expansion i think is a complete game they don't need to add any more to this game it doesn't need a ton of expansions if they could just keep all of that stuff in print and available they have a total winner i love this game it's great it's super fun even when you're making some mistakes it's still fun so all right well thanks again for watching everybody and we'll talk to you later bye bye